Um, so today I am joined by um, Professor Tim Spector, who is our principal investigator here in the UK, and Dr. Andrew Chan, who's our principal investigator in the United States. Um, it's amazing to have these guys on the call today because they're not only doing research, but they're also caring for patients. Um, so we'll have them for about 35 to 40 minutes today. Um, the structure of this webinar is um, the guys are going to go through some of the data, um, not only in the US, but also in, in the United Kingdom. Um, we're going to talk about some similarities. We're going to talk about some differences. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the, the further work that's going on, some of the scientific papers that are coming out of um, your data that you're um, contributing. Thank you so much for participating. If you do have the app, if you don't have the app, I encourage you to download it. Um, it's really uh, providing you know, our governments and our scientists with some critical information around coronavirus. And um, anyways, over to you, Andy, for a quick introduction and then off to Tim. Hi there, everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here today to share with you what we've been doing on behalf of the COVID symptom tracker and all of our citizen scientists that are involved in this work. I wanted to start my video. I don't know if I can do that. It looks like it's, you've not, uh, you have to open, open it for me, Sarah. Okay, I'll, um, I'll try to do that now. So as Sarah mentioned, I'm uh, based in Boston. I'm a physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital and also a professor of immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard School of Public Health. Much of my work has been in the epidemiology of chronic disease, including cancer. And uh, now that we've actually uh, realized now what an incredible impact uh, COVID-19 is having on our research and also on the health of our communities, We've been very privileged to partner with Zoe and Dr. Spector at King's College in this effort to use the COVID symptom tracker to gather data on COVID-19 in real time. So just to go through um, what we've been doing, and I'll advance to the next slide, please. Sure. We have been focused here in the US on using the COVID symptom tracker as a novel method collect data on the current pandemic throughout the United States and also in the UK. The focus on the work in the US has been to have individuals who are already enrolled in various studies across the United States use the app to download information for us to use in our studies. Some of our key partners are, as we've shown on this slide, the nurses' health studies, as well as other population-based cohorts around the country. In addition, the Stand Up to Cancer Foundation, who was an early partner in our efforts to reach out to people with cancer as well as their communities. In addition, Dr. Spector's group has also been working in relationship to the Twins UK cohort, which he'll speak about, and also, we're obviously very uh, happy to have millions of members of the general public work on this effort as well. So although we have a focus in the US, in particular on involving people who are already part of existing studies, we very much want to bring in new partners and new citizen scientists that are also interested in contributing to our data. Next. So let me tell you a little bit about our cohorts. I'll start with the Nurses Health Study cohort, which is a cohort that I am actively involved in, which is comprised of actually three different studies that have been started since 1976 that have enrolled female registered nurses across the United States. These have been really uh, key participants in offering very valuable information on their diet, lifestyle, and also their diagnoses of various illness, illnesses, including cancer. They've been incredibly engaged since 1976, providing us information with over 90% follow-up, which allows us to really make some key advances in the science behind why diet, smoking, and other risk factors are so important in preventing diseases like cancer, as well as heart disease. Given that these participants are all across the country and have shared so much information about what they've been doing over the last several decades, we thought it was critical to reach out to them to see how they were doing with respect to the current pandemic, 
but also allow us a chance to collect data on whether they're being personally affected by COVID-19 and also how that might also be linked to some of the data that they've been providing us over a number of years. In addition to the Nurses' Health Study, we've also engaged with 15 other cohorts across the country, which also have participants that are currently actively participating in providing data on a variety of risk factors. In addition, we've also been very focused on recruiting individuals in the community that also are living with cancer. And we, this is a very important uh, initiative because we know that people living with cancer have very specific risk factors for COVID-19, and also early data suggests that they may have worsened outcomes. Data from China and other countries show that people with cancer have a lot of other health issues, and some of these also overlap with risk factors for COVID-19. We also know that cancer patients may be at higher risk of infection by virtue of specific bioreceptors on their cancers, as well as the effects of, of their medications that they're getting for treatment of their cancer. We really don't have a lot of information on sort of the impact as well of coronavirus and COVID-19 on their cancer treatment. Many of these individuals are actually finding that their regular doctor visits have been suspended because of the outbreak. Also, some of their treatments that they normally have been receiving have also been stopped. So we actually need to collect data to understand if these uh, changes in their cancer care ultimately will impact their long-term outcomes. We've been really privileged to have many partners in the cancer community work with us on this effort. This includes the Stand Up to Cancer Foundation, which is an incredibly active network of cancer researchers across the United States, as well as cancer advocates and also individuals living with cancer in the community that have raised many millions of dollars for cancer research within the US and across the globe. In addition, we've partnered with the American Cancer Society, which has a very strong advocacy for patients with cancer, but also has a very strong in interest in the prevention of cancer. We've actually been able to use this COVID symptom tracker in cohorts that are in the American Cancer Society network that are involved in cancer prevention research. More recently, we've also engaged in the UK, Cancer Research UK. I've also been privileged to be a part of the Cancer Research UK effort through one of their Catalyst Awards, and they have also been part of the effort to reach out to cancer researchers and patients living with cancer. And then finally, we've also had the opportunity to work with the Dr. Susan Love Foundation, which includes an army of women of over 900,000 people across the US that have been living with breast cancer or are allied with people living with breast cancer. And in that foundation, they've also been very helpful in trying to engage people in providing data through the COVID symptom tracker so we can understand better how COVID-19 is impacting individuals with cancer as well as their loved ones. This has been part of a broader effort to also engage other supporters that are involved in disease research. More recently, we've also been able to work with various foundations that are also advocating for patients with chronic diseases that we think are probably also impacted by COVID-19. And these are just some of these different foundations listed on this slide. We hope in the future to engage more organizations as we certainly understand the importance of trying to make sure we capture as much information as possible from individuals in the community that have different chronic diseases for which medical care may have been affected. Right. And Tim, can you talk about some of the research that's going on with Twins UK right now? You know, lots of your twins are being tested around the country. Um, and actually, a few of the people tuning in today to the webinar are either one of the twins or um, have family members who are. Sure, yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff. So originally, the whole idea was to start by basing this around the twins and spread it to the uh, rest of the world and that's exactly what happened uh, and we've got uh, our first uh, analyses of, of around 3,000 twins who uh, are part of the um, symptom app and we worked out that a percentage of those had predicted COVID and we've worked out the, the genetics of that um, condition I discussed this briefly last week but we, we get a heritability of around 50%, uh, which means that about half of the differences between people uh, are, are due to genetic factors, uh, influencing how the, the same virus will, will have an effect on the body differently. And so our own genes determine that 
uh, to a large extent, but it also leaves 50% for the environment, uh, which we're also still trying to understand, which could be things like the weather, could be things like humidity, could be pollution, uh, could be other bits like diet or uh, other factors we still don't understand. So we're keeping an open mind on that. So the heritability is really important. Um, that shows us there's a genetic component. We've got some work ongoing uh, to see whether particular genes are involved and we're particularly interested in, in, in one gene that uh, is involved in your, how your white cells, uh, the B cells, uh, we're finding a signal there that uh, this B cell receptor is also in the lung and we think that this might be related to at least the lung component of what's going on. So the twins are fantastic from a genetic point of view uh, and we may have some exciting discoveries there. Um, we're also visiting um, a few of the twins uh, at home, uh, a few of them that live uh, near the hospital and uh, are living together. Uh, we're asking them to provide some blood for antibody testing. So we have three cars going around the southeast of England now uh, trying to pick up uh, blood samples from twins so we can look and uh, see whether your response to the virus in terms of your antibodies is also genetic rather than just your symptoms. Because the complexity of this virus is amazing and it could well be that uh, you could have a really quite reasonable classic infection and, and not many antibodies or a very mild infection and very strong antibodies. And we don't really understand that yet. And so this will be a, a fantastic resource for the rest of the world uh, when we link up these antibodies to the symptoms and the twins. Uh, we've also got some other ongoing data suggesting that um, blood groups might be important. Um, I can't tell you the result yet because I haven't actually seen it myself, but um, all these things are possible because the twins have uh, been collecting data for the last 25 years. And so we have this enormous rich database we can just link in to whatever's going on now in the app. So uh, we'll keep you updated on that uh, as, we, as we progress about the twins. Great, so we're just gonna, ahead of going into some of the, uh, the great maps and, and data that Andy and Tim are gonna speak through, we'll, we'll just give you a quick overview on app stats and how they're looking in terms of the, the difference between what we're seeing in the United States and in the UK in terms of contributors. So we've, we've just passed the 3 million mark for UK contributors. So well done all of you for sharing and for contributing. Um, and what that means is that, you know, we've got um, much more rich data across the country. And then in the United States, Andy, do you want to talk about growth in terms of um, how we're growing the different cohorts? Yeah, so we've been really, I, as I mentioned, pleased to be able to recruit from multiple different population-based cohorts across the country, which has occurred uh, over time. So we've been uh, inviting people since uh, around the 2nd or 3rd of April to down uh, for, for cohorts to, to mail invitations or email invitations to their members. And they've uh, come on board enthusiastically, as you can see from, from the graph. So we've had a very steady rise in the number of cohorts that have participated, as well as the number of people who've contributed to the app. Alongside these cohorts, obviously, we've been also gratified uh, by the um, cohort members recruiting their friends and family. So we do have a growing number of people from the general public who are also joining uh, the app here in the US. So we've had a very deliberate process by which we wanted to make sure that we connect with people that are in existing studies and also are finding that uh, the interest in the general public has also been quite strong. So we're hoping to, um, to uh, roll this out much more broadly among the US population. Uh, as you guys have all done in the UK. Absolutely. So if you're watching, um, if you're tuning in from the United States, please share this with friends and family um, so that we can get more of the public involved as well. 
In terms of daily assessments, um, we have a really strong retention rate and we get lots of questions around, um, you know, how many people are still coming back and reporting on a daily basis. So as you can see in the United Kingdom, we are over nearly a million assessments on a daily basis and that's just over 80,000 in the United States, um, which means that we're still getting um, sufficient data to, to really analyze um, the symptoms that uh, you guys are sharing with us. So I'm going to move on to, to US research and um, Andy's going to talk a bit about um, what the team at Mass General Hospital is doing. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we are actively invested in making this a important tool for researchers across the country. So we've actually stood up a first of its kind coronavirus pandemic epidemiology consortium, which has been a enormous success in being able to bring in uh, investigators and their participants from all across the country in various cohort studies. So as I, as I mentioned, we have originally started with the nurses health study cohorts because of my direct involvement with that study but we've also been successful in reaching, uh, as I said, 15 other cohorts in the United States, including some very large uh, research studies. Uh, for example, we've been also uh, working with the California Teachers Study, the American Cancer Society Prevention Cohort. Uh, we've also in recruited the multi-ethnic cohort that's based on the West Coast and the Black Women's Health Study. Uh, and we're continuing to grow this uh, within US-based cohorts. And of course, you know, as Tim mentioned, the UK twin study um, is also a very important cohort to be uh, uh, contributing data to this consortia. So we consider this really a binational effort to really bring together US and UK participants together so that we can, by virtue of numbers, really get at some of these key questions that we're interested in answering. Many of these cohorts, uh, like the UK twin study, have been gracious in providing us blood samples, which we can use ultimately to do genetic work uh, and also be a place where we can uh, verify and validate some of the findings that are uh, currently underway in UK twins. And also we have the opportunity to, uh, in uh, new studies that are underway now, think about also doing antibody testing or other types of tests within the cohorts to get some additional information to enrich the data collected on the app. So give you, I'll give you a sense of where we're at in terms of data. So on the next slide, we show here specifically the types of questions we ask people on the COVID symptom tracker in the US. As you can see, there are a set of questions that we ask about their health status. That's all map, mapped out on the left-hand side. They are uh, provided a very, uh, uh, very uh, detailed um, discussion of their privacy rights and their uh, uh, rights to participate in research. And one of the key uh, components of what we do is make sure that people feel comfortable that the data that they're providing through the app is appropriately safeguarded with the highest standards, both in the US and the UK with respect to data protection for sensitive health information. And on the right side, you see a schematic of the types of questions we ask on the app. Many people are already on the app and so know these very well, but just if you're not yet on the app, um, this gives you a sense of the kinds of things we're asking. I do wanna emphasize that this is not just for people that have symptoms. This is also for people that are currently feeling well because we wanna know that. We actually wanna know who in the community is feeling well as well as who in the community is, de is developing symptoms. And the importance of having this information on a daily basis is that we can see what happens over time. Do people who feel well eventually develop symptoms? And what are the reasons for why that is happening? Next. Sure. Andy and, and Tim, I don't know if you guys can turn on your camera. I know you both were having a bit of difficulty with switching it on from your side. Um, and I'm unable to do it on my side. So I think some of the people in the chat were just asking if they can see you. Yeah, unfortunately it still says I'm not able to share my video, so. It says the host has stopped it. Yeah. That's you, oh, Kirsten. <laughs> right, Andy, I'm gonna make you the host and then hopefully you can switch your camera on so everybody ah, okay. can see Great. you in Boston. Great. 
<laughs> so this, this is an example of some of the uh, uh, power of the data we're generating. So this is a, a map of users across the US. You can see the dark blue represent the places in the US where we have the most users. And I think this reflects uh, both uh, the networks of collaborators we've engaged, but also just the interest in specific parts of the country. But uh, it's clear that we have participants all across the United States, which has been very gratifying. Uh, and we really want to encourage people, if you're in one of these states, to continue providing data. This slide shows you actually the distribution of where people are reporting symptoms. The darker the uh, uh, purple, uh, the darker the, or the more the people in that area are reporting symptoms. As you can see, there are areas around the country where symptom burden is, is much higher. For example, uh, Massachusetts there on the right hand side, which is near, which is obviously where I am right over here, as well as um, New York uh, and other parts of the South. Next. But what's key is that even though some of these areas have a large burden of symptoms, there's actually oftentimes a mismatch in terms of the uh, report of people getting tested. So this actually is a slide that shows the distribution of the population in the US that's undergone testing. And you can see it's actually remarkably low and very low in many states where there's a high degree of symptoms. So this mismatch in terms of the number of symptoms, the symptom burden in the population with the amount of testing that's happening is a, a, a major concern because if we don't test these people with symptoms, we actually won't be able to document if they have COVID. And this also illustrates the power of the predictive modeling that we've been doing, uh, which shows that we can use symptom scores to predict COVID incidents or actually COVID burden, uh, which Dr. Spector will show in a moment. But this suggests that if we still continue to have this crippling lack of testing across the country, we have an option, which is to use symptom reports to predict where uh, incidents of COVID will be greater, to really understand where the next hotspots of COVID will be uh, that can be used as a way to, to address this lack of testing. Also, as we start to think about parts of the country where we've reached kind of a peak in terms of caseload and things hopefully will start to decline, this will give us some rapid data to use to understand whether we can start to loosen restrictions on things like home isolation uh, and shelter in place. So we actually really think this data is important and will only be enriched with greater participation from the people listening today and also their family members. Uh, and this will be a way for us, I think, to provide information that can get more of the country open faster uh, in a safe way. And now, Andy, for, for those who are tuning in from the UK and just seeing bits and pieces of, of what testing looks like on the news in the United States, um, what does it look like on the ground as a doctor? And, and, you know, what are the differences you're hearing about from your colleagues in different states in the US? Yeah, so we were incredibly unprepared in terms of the volume of people that are developing symptoms in terms of offering testing. So, you know, we in, in Boston, for example, had uh, basically the ability to offer maybe hundreds of tests at the very early start of this pandemic, which was not capable of meeting the need. We've been very uh, fortunate to be able to develop partnerships with private companies with laboratories at both Mass General and other institutions to really ramp up testing. So now we're at the point where we're testing about 10,000 people a day, uh, which is an enormous increase, but still by all accounts, uh, not enough to get a strong picture of how much this is affecting uh, our general communities. We're still not at a point yet where we're able to offer testing to everybody who actually needs a test. Uh, we're still making some um, priorities based on the symptoms or uh, what their work exposures are, et cetera. Ultimately, the goal is to be able to offer mass testing that is able to get a better handle on who is uh, positive in the community uh, and also who is positive in the community that may be asymptomatic. And that would be what's really needed to be able to reopen up things uh, in terms of schools and restaurants, et cetera. Uh, so until we get to that point, we need to have, I think, the symptom data to help guide us. Perfect. Sorry. Here we go. 
So uh, I just wanted to share with the group, um, I think some of the important data that's coming out of our studies. As I mentioned, one of the key um, uh, stakeholders in this research has been um, participants enrolled in cohort studies, including the nurses health study, which obviously provides us a unique opportunity to examine the association of being a healthcare worker with risk of developing COVID. In addition, we obviously have recruited a, a large number of general uh, public, members of the general public that are healthcare workers. And we uh, were able to show in our data set, uh, uh, along with the UK, that being a healthcare worker, uh, not surprisingly, is associated with a very uh, uh, high risk of developing COVID. But until now, until we had this data from this COVID symptom tracker, we actually didn't know how much higher the risk was if you were a healthcare worker and what sort of was important predictors of getting infected if you were a healthcare worker. So this is just early data, uh, which is uh, going to be available shortly in a preprint that shows that the number of people that test positive on the app uh, is still a, a relatively small proportion um, uh, of people overall, but the number that test positive that are healthcare workers is substantially higher uh, than the general public. In addition, the maps, and that's both in the United States and the United Kingdom, and if you look on the map below, that gives you a distribution of the number of healthcare workers that have been diagnosed with COVID-19 across the United States. And you can see that there is a high burden of disease in healthcare workers in some of the basic uh, hotspots in the US, like New York and New Jersey, as well as Louisiana, where there's established uh, really high caseloads. Uh, but also there are particular hotspots where healthcare workers are getting infected at a higher rate in the UK, as you can see on the map on the right. We've delved much more deeply into these um, maps and gotten much more information about why healthcare workers are a particular risk by looking, for example, at data that we've collected on their use of personal protective equipment like gowns and gloves, things like that, which uh, uh, are things that we're going to be sharing uh, very, very uh, in the very near future, which I think will really help with the public health response and making sure that we protect this really vital resource. Absolutely. Um, before we get into um, UK maps, where we'll hand over to Tim, um, Garth is is asking um, in the chat: Is relative lack of US testing due to lack of capacity? It's a combination of lack of kits. So we don't have uh, enough test kits and the kits are, are quite uh, uh, precious in terms of what's needed to, to do the testing. So the brushes and the swabs that are needed are in short supply. Um, there's also a lack of the basic uh, uh, reagents that are needed to test for the actual presence of the virus in the combination of lack of capacity from the materials needed to make the kits. Uh, as well as the lack of some of the basic um, uh, structures to distribute the kits effectively across the country. So that's one of the problems also is there's not a centralized supply of kits as uh, we had hoped there would have been. It's really very decentralized. So each state kind of has their own access to kits and there's no centralized manufacturer of these kits. So that's been a real problem in terms of getting the kits to where they need it the most. Absolutely. Um, quite a few people are asking about the papers and the, the preprint. So if you visit um, covid.joinzoe.com, on the blog we'll be publishing articles linking to the preprints um, before they uh, before you'll find them anywhere else. Um, so make sure that you check the website on a daily basis. We're updating it with new content and new research nearly every day. Um, you can also subscribe to our emails, which gets you that information first as well. Um, now over to Tim. Tim, can you, I'm, I'm trying to turn your camera on. Andy, I think you might need to hand over the, the hosting to Tim. Okay. To see him. Um, let's see if that works. Sorry, everyone. We typically don't have video issues today. How do I do that actually? Um, um, if you tap the three dots in, the, in your camera, then you can switch it over. Tim, why don't we start by um, having you chat through, um, I guess, the, the progression of, of our model here in the UK. So, you know, we can see over time, we didn't have a GIF um, this time because we had feedback that um, it went too quickly. So, um, 
you know, on the on March the 29th, you can talk about uh, predicted cases, and now we're we're at April 29th. Yes. So uh, a, a month of data, and I mean the graph tells the story really. Um, really massive numbers at, at the end of March, beginning of April. Then it fell quite dramatically, and but you can, you can it's kept falling, but the rate has uh, eased off a bit, I'd say. Um, so you can see it's it's not likely to get to zero for a, for a while, um, and. Uh, there's all kinds of reasons why that might be. Um, there's obviously some noise of, of uh, misclassification that some people may be getting other uh, allergies um, that are uh, or not real COVID, um, or that um, some of those initial the in initial impacts are slightly wearing off, and that uh, there is still residual infection around. And What's also interesting is um, that the number of the rate of hospital uh, admissions for COVID hasn't dropped as fast as it has in the population. So it's also another possible theory that um, the same about hospitals or care homes that's, that's keeping this uh, going a bit more than it should be. Um, but nevertheless, the trend is down, which is good. Um, and we should uh, be, be welcoming that because there will be a certain threshold we get to um, whether it's one in 500 people or one in a thousand people where we will be more relaxed about uh, ending lockdown. And um, I don't think we've got a map, but there are, if you look at the regional maps, this is the whole of the country, this, the trends are the same, but actually the numbers are much lower in places like Scotland and Wales and the Southwest, where I think, uh, questions about ending lockdown could start much earlier. And I think that's the, um, uh, the other big message here. Um, the, um, so if we go on to um, the next uh, slide, Sarah, or any, any other questions you had on that? Um, well, my camera's now working, so there you go. Brilliant. Now we can. Well, now we can see you. Um, so I, I guess we can we can go into some questions. But Tim, there were a few questions um, throughout this that um, that I've answered um, through through the chat. But um, quite a few people are asking about what's the difference between the NHS's um, contact tracing app and our app, and is there a plan for us to work together? Absolutely. Yes. This is a question I get asked a lot. And it's difficult because the NHS app hasn't been released. It's still being tested. It's still in development. And there's no official announcements about it, although politicians talk about it. And it is, has a different purpose. So the NHS X app, as we'll call it, is for contact tracing. And it, it will contain a Bluetooth element to it. So uh, however it's done, you'll either get a test or maybe there'll be a button you press and then from that moment you'll be seen as a case and all your contacts in your phone that you've been in contact with for the for the last week will be themselves contacted and asked to undergo the same process and your phone will then be linked up so that uh, there'll be a proximity device if you get too close to these people now uh, that's a very different proposition to what uh, we're doing, uh, which is the idea that we're maintaining uh, an idea of how many cases there are in a certain regional community and allowing people to log their symptoms progressively uh, over time, uh, which will allow, in a way, a, a better understanding of the disease. It allows research to carry on, which is not possible with the uh, NHS app and has no real issues of, of privacy. Uh, or taking over your phone, which may have some other technical problems. So I think the best way would be uh, to combine these two so that uh, our app is still used for research, for understanding more about the disease, uh, for giving you a, a personal prediction of whether you've had COVID without needing a test um, and alerting authorities that a particular region, community or county or island uh, are having a hot spot of problems and then you might move in with a public health team that might offer people uh, these uh, 
this contact tracing app. Uh, it's all speculation until we know exactly what's in the NHS X app at the moment. Right. Um, so there are a few questions about um, reinfection rate. Is there any data on the reinfection rate at all that you guys are aware of? From our data, there's, uh, we have some individuals who uh, have logged that they've had some symptoms and then uh, three weeks later uh, logged again. I think one month is, is, too sh is probably too short for most people. And there were these uh, cases from China that suggested people uh, had been infected sort of six to eight weeks apart. Uh, but it's never clear whether they got reinfected or it was the same virus that came back. And we have seen symptoms lasting as long as five weeks, which can fluctuate. So it can be very hard to separate these out. So until we get testing on a weekly basis, it's the same individuals, it's going to be very difficult to sort it out. I don't know if Andy's got any... Uh, yeah, I think that's actually one thing I should mention is that's a key question that we actually hope that app users will help us answer because uh, in the near future, I think maybe uh, even today, the new um, version of the app will actually ask participants uh, if they've gotten um, multiple tests for COVID, which will allow us to track whether some people are uh, testing positive, then negative, and then positive again. So. I think it just emphasizes how important it is for people to uh, check in on a daily basis, provide information, because if we can track uh, if that's happening in real time across the population, we'll be able to know whether this is actually a true phenomenon and you know what are the risk factors for this happening. Uh, because at this point, it's just speculation and it's a few reports here and there from various countries. No one knows what to make of that which um, is basically the reason why we not need more data from people that are uh, on the app. But definitely it's now a possibility that you can have an infection and not have the antibodies. And therefore, in theory, uh, you could get reinfected. So again, another reason that people should keep tracking, even if they've had what they think is the uh, sort of classical symptoms, because uh, anything can happen. I think we've got to keep all of us very vigilant and an open mind about this this really strange disease. Definitely. A couple of questions about the differences in, in the US and the, and the UK. So Andy, in terms of testing, there are a few people asking, um, do you need to pay for a test in the United States? And then where might you go to get tested? The issue in the US, I think, has been mostly a question of access. And so if people need a test, um, uh, and they have been uh, pre-screened to be someone who is appropriate for testing. In other words, they have certain uh, symptoms or certain risk factors. Uh, then testing is generally covered by either the patient or the person's insurance company or oftentimes by uh, the public health authority. So, so in general, people are not being asked to pay out of pocket for those type of swab tests because of the uh, importance of making sure we get a handle on that uh, for the general community. The antibody tests are different, and that's that's uh, something that's coming uh, on board more and more now. And at this point, the uh, uh, antibody tests are being covered by some insurance companies, not all. Um, so there is uh, uh, now uh, ability for people to go in and, and get an antibody test if they pay out of pocket from certain private companies. So it's very much uh, a patchy coverage and it's a very fragmented system, which is why uh, it's been such a challenge to really know, um, you know what the full scope of the disease is across the country. Because you know, because the pa testing is patchy, also the number of people that are testing positive and the number of people that are actually having antibodies, that information is also uh, quite patchy. So uh, again, you know, all the more reason for a more systematic way of collecting data uh, like the app. And then there's another question um, about working with the government. So obviously in the UK, um, we've got the NHS. In the United States, how do you guys find yourselves working um, with state and federal government as well as the CDC? 
Yeah, so we um, have, have, as you um, may have heard, again, had a very fragmented public health response. You know, although we do have certainly, uh, you know, on a national level, uh, scientists that are working on COVID-19 and, and, and have been actively engaged, I think, in promoting, um, you know, every possible effort to prevent its spread. Uh, most of the, um, you know, local response has been charged by um, the individual states and the communities. So it does make it more challenging for us uh, in the United States to have a cohesive strategy to be able to basically um, address this in a, uh, a consistent way across uh, different parts of the country. We have been uh, working to engage public health uh, authorities in the government uh, in various states. Uh, we, for example, have partnered with um, a group uh, in Texas who has direct access to um, city and county governments uh, and their response to COVID-19, which has been uh, enormously helpful in getting uh, folks in the state of Texas to provide information on the app. Uh, but, you know, so we're sort of working at it from a state by state, on a state by state basis, because there isn't a, a real national uh, place to do this. Right. Um, a few questions about diabetes. Um, and Tim, I know that we're not quite there yet with our diabetes paper or diabetes research, but is there a plan to look at this further? Absolutely, yes. So we've got a, a, a paper coming out on obesity as a risk factor, uh, and there is often an overlap between type 2 diabetes uh, and obesity, uh, but we haven't been able to separate the two out well enough at the moment because a lot of the type 2 diabetes patients have been in a way self-isolating more than the people who don't have type 2 diabetes because uh, they're extra worried and so teasing that apart is taking a bit more time. Uh, but certainly we are aware about that and uh, we are doing some work in the, uh, in the cohorts like the twins that have a lot of um, glucose tolerance measures and responses to foods and things because we think that is important that there is a, a clear link between your metabolism and uh, your risk of getting severe uh, infections, uh, which could all be related to either diet, the way you metabolize food, or your gut microbes. So uh, that's definitely something we're, we're going to be looking at in the next month or two. Yeah, quite a few people asking questions about whether or not they can get their hands on antibody testing in the UK and whether or not they're reliable. Can you talk about that, Tim? Uh, getting hold of them is really difficult because uh, the UK and the government doesn't believe in private testing as much as they do in the US and in other European countries where actually most private labs have set up now to do them. Uh, there are a few here, but I think they're quite hard to get hold of. Um, its reliability is, is hard to assess because um, the US recently tested 14 different kits and found only four or five of them uh, were good enough for them. So, but there's a problem in that if you test positive, generally that's a sign you have had an antibody response and it's fine. But there may be many people with false negatives or who get an antibody response that isn't really strong. And that's the problem is so it may not be the actual test itself, just the way that we're all responding very differently to this virus. And we don't know yet whether an antibody response that's rather feeble still gives you protection against uh, having another reinfection. So, my belief is we should, in the UK, have a more pragmatic approach to this, except there is no fantastic test, but actually start rolling this out and stop being quite so fussy uh, about it. Just agree some standard uh, ways of doing it across the board, get these people who have desperately tested positive out of the way and um, uh, get more people tested. I think there's, we're never gonna get it a precise art because it also depends exactly which week you test people. And some people might be uh, losing their antibodies quickly, others might gain them slowly. It's much more complex than we've, we've, we've thought about. But it's, it's not the holy grail, it's never gonna be, but it, it, it is a useful tool that we should be doing more of. Absolutely. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, a few people have asked if we are launching in other countries. And actually this week we launched the app in Sweden, 
Um, we've got research partners in Sweden that we work quite closely with. Um, Tim, do you want to talk about um, how they're rolling that out and, um, and what we're hoping to learn? And then hopefully we can have a webinar about it in a few weeks' time. Yeah, we can have a webinar in Swedish just to make things interesting. So it was quite tough actually changing the app. Um, the Zoe team who, who did this to translate it all into Swedish, um, and it did take a while longer, but it, it, it's been going for 24 hours, and I think they've uh, got about 25,000 people so far uh, signed up in a, in a small country, which is pretty good. Um, and it's all come from the University of Lund. They had a big backing from the university there. Uh, and interesting, there was a bit of a backlash from the government saying, oh, are you going to worry people, um, make them so anxious they'll rush to the hospitals and swamp the health healthcare system, which is a strange reaction. But um, it seems to be doing well there. And I think it'd be fascinating to see how it works in Sweden that have never really locked down. They've really, they hardly changed their way of life at all. Uh, most of the restaurants and cafes and things are still open. The only thing they're banned there is having meetings of more than 50 people. So I think um, this app could have a totally different uh, exciting role in Sweden. Hopefully we'll have a, a webinar to, to catch up on that later. Definitely. Um, just a couple more questions before you guys head back off to, um, to work with um, your researchers and patients. Um, a few people have, have asked, um, could you estimate that if we stopped all non-essential working for two to three weeks, would, would we be able to get out of lockdown faster? What do you think, Tim? Um, I think it, it, yes is the answer. The question is by how much is difficult. Um, I get the feeling that a lot of the problem in the UK is being driven around hospitals and care homes. Um, and that seems to be a problem we, we can't quite resolve. I think looking at our graphs, uh, you know, the population of the working age population are doing a pretty good job of uh, reducing infection rates fast. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure further restrictions would, would really help us. Um, that's my personal view. But listen, everyone's just guessing at this moment. What I think we should do is actually do some controlled trials, not guess, do what you know, the UK was really good at is actually designing epidemiological trials, start off with some regions and test those ones and see if it works. You know, take the Isle of Wight or Cornwall or uh, the Shetland Islands or whatever it is. Let's, let's get them unlocked and see how it goes. Great. Final question for you, Andy. Um, so we talked a few weeks ago about clusters of symptoms that we saw here in the UK. Is there any early information that you can share with us about whether or not symptoms are different in the United States or are they largely the same? They look fairly consistent. I think one of the things that uh, has been clear is that um, the, the spectrum of symptoms varies, does vary from person to person. Uh, and also it depends on when you sort of capture people uh, in the phase of illness. So, uh, you know, depending on whether someone's cat caught an earlier stage versus later, uh, the symptoms can vary. Uh, but it, when it comes to kind of looking between the two countries, um, the overall complex of symptoms and whether that predicts COVID seems to be uh, quite similar, which is something that we showed in in one of the papers that's going to be published uh, shortly and is already in the in the archive. So um, you know that does speak to how uh, important it is for us to uh, collect data across the two countries, just verify that there is consistency within our countries, um, and uh, but at the same time still use the data on an individual level to clarify where there might be differences. A lot of the symptoms that were reported out of uh, China and Asia originally were that you know you had to have a fever or cough to have COVID-19. And that's clearly not the case. And uh, the reason why that was, was, uh, was uh, thought to be true was because most of the people that were uh, collecting data were really only collecting data from people that were the most sick and severely affected that came to the hospital. Uh, again, the power of our approach is that we're also collecting data from people that are at home that may not be sick enough to show up in the hospital. And so we're able to capture some of those more vague symptoms um, like fatigue or, or maybe uh, loss of taste or smell. 
and it looks like those are much more sensitive and important to capture uh, uh, than some of these later symptoms where it's almost too late to, to really make the diagnosis. Great. Thanks so much, Andy. And thank you, Tim, for your time. Um, a few people were just asking if they can find this webinar after the fact. Um, you can follow us on YouTube or visit covid.joinzoe.com, which is up on the screen, um, to find all of the latest research and information um, We'll soon be publishing more information on the United States research, which is really exciting. And um, for those of you who asked in the chat and in the Q&A if we have an Android app coming, so you can download the Android app via our website. Um, Google is um, not surfacing as many COVID apps, so you might not be able to find it in the search just yet, but we're working with them to make it more available. Um, when you do search for it. So um, right now you can go to covid.joinzoe.com and download the Android app. Um, for any of the questions that we didn't answer, we'll try to pick them up on our blog. So please check back there regularly. And again, thank you, Tim and Andy for your time today. I know you're very, very busy treating patients and, and conducting research. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thanks a lot.